Last week, we kicked off a series entitled Far More, and I ask you to pray a big prayer for me. To pray that God would do far more in and through our church. I believe that God is working, that he is bringing revival to our church, that he is bringing a movement of God that changes lives, that works in the hearts of people. And I've been praying that God would do far more through our church. But today, in order for him to do far more, I believe that he might require us to sacrifice. In order to see God do far more in your life, he might call you to give up certain things for him. In our passage today, Abraham is asked to give up his son, Isaac. I'd like to begin reading God's word in Genesis chapter 22, beginning at verse 7. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. And when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful this morning that you did not withhold your son from us. Lord, that you gave him to be a sacrifice for our sins. God, I pray this morning that the Holy Spirit would work in each person's life here today and he would reveal any part of our hearts that we have not surrendered to Jesus. Lord, I pray that as a church, as a group of disciples and followers of Christ, Lord, that we would surrender our whole hearts to you. That we would sacrifice our lives for the kingdom of God. So that Jesus might be made famous. So that the lost would hear and know of Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning to hear and to understand your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I read a study this week. They did a test, scientists did, on a set of twins. They had twins, two men. They were basically identical in every way, and they said for a period of time we want one twin to exercise and work out, and the other twin we want to just be sedentary and to sit around and do nothing. The results were pretty obvious in that the one twin who worked out had a lower body fat, he was more healthy, he looked better, and all of these things. But what shocked the scientist was just how quickly things deteriorated for the person, the twin, who was sedentary, who did not move. They were shocked at how quickly his muscles atrophied. Meaning they became weaker and weaker because of lack of use. And they said within just a few days, they had begun to atrophy. I read that study, and I thought, does the same thing happen to our souls? Do our spiritual muscles atrophy and become weaker because of lack of use? That's a question that I've been thinking about. 
Some, Some of us here have been talking about our faith for years, and we come to church and we say we have this faith, and we say we have all of these things, but have you exercised your faith lately? Or are your spiritual muscles weak? I think the best way to exercise our faith is through sacrifice. When we have to give up something and give it to the Lord, that's when we really find where our faith is. When we think about exercise, we think about going to a gym. If you want to exercise, you have to give up certain things. If I'm going to go to a gym, I'm going to have to give up my time. I'm going to have to wake up earlier. I'm going to have to sacrifice some portion of my day to go to that gym. I'm also going to have to sacrifice some of my money. I'm going to have to pay a, a membership fee to go to this gym. Also, I'm going to have to sacrifice my desires because I don't want to get up and go to a gym, right? I'm going to have to sacrifice some of these things that I might want instead. And the result, hopefully, is a body that is healthy and that is in shape. And to have that, we must sacrifice for it. And in the same way for Christians, if we want to see God do far more in our church and in our lives, it might require sacrifice. Oh, we've got a mission trip coming up at the church, or we've got an outreach plan to, to reach more people and to tell them about Jesus. i got a, I got a family vacation. I can't sacrifice my family vacation. I can't sacrifice uh, time off at work and these other things. I, I can do that. Oh, we've, oh, we've got, got Sunday, Sunday school classes. classes. We've, we've got, got small groups to get involved and grow in your faith. faith. I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather go do something else. I have this hobby or this thing that I like going and doing, and that's just not going to work for me. Maybe you say, you know what? I, I know we need teachers to teach our uh, children's church, and I know we need teachers to teach children Sunday school, and but I don't want to sacrifice sitting in the service. I don't want to sacrifice going to my Sunday school class to teach, teach those kids. kids. Or, or maybe, maybe you say, I don't want to sacrifice my sanity to sit down there with the babies in the nursery, right? right? Maybe, maybe there's all kinds of things that we might have to do to sacrifice to see God's kingdom grow. And today we're going to ask, are you willing? Are you willing to sacrifice for God? Now, I know what you're thinking. We are talking about the renovation of the gymnasium. We're talking about uh, that in our joint Sunday school class. It's going to be $2.8 million. And you're thinking this is going to be a message on money. About sacrificing our money so that we can give and build this building. And I want to tell you, we do need you to sacrifice your finances. We need you to sacrifice those things. But I want to tell you that this is not about money today. There will be a sermon coming up on that where we talk about those things. But before we get to that, I think it's so important to talk about your heart. God can do so much more with a full heart than he can with a full wallet. And before we begin talking about money and raising money and giving money, I think God's not after your money, but he's after your heart. And I want to ask today to check your heart. Have, Have you fully surrendered your heart to Jesus, Jesus or is there something you're holding back from him? Is there, there some part of your life that you say, God, you can have all of this, but you can't have this part of my life. You can't have that. We're going to look at the story of Abraham and Isaac today, and I have three questions for you this morning. The first is this, what is your response when God asks you to sacrifice for him? What is your response if God were to come to you and demand something from you, would you give it to him? Would you sacrifice for him? Look at what he says to Abraham in verse 1 of chapter 22 of Genesis. After these things, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham... And he said, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Right off the bat, we see God comes and he asks Abraham for his most prized possession, his only son. 
Now, now I do, do want to say off the bat that, that people have debated this passage and thought, well, how could God ask such a thing of Abraham? Isn't child sacrifice wrong in the Old Testament? Don't they say that it's wrong? Isn't all of this wrong to kill another person? And I would say that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. And therefore, as God looks out at all of humanity, the fact that each of us take another breath is a gift from God above. Because he could demand your life at any moment and be just in taking it. But I do want to show you that God never intends to take Isaac's life here. He never intends for Abraham to go through because there's an important word in verse 1. Look at what it says. After these things, God tested Abraham. He didn't want Isaac's life, but he wanted to test Abraham. Now, when we hear that word test, and I want to tell you it's different from tempt. In James, the Bible says that uh, Satan tempts people, but God never tempts anyone, but he tests Warren Wiersbe, a pastor, said it this way, Satan tempts us to bring out the worst in us, but God tests us to bring out the best. God's intention for testing Abraham was to increase Abraham's faith. It was meant for his good. Now, if you'll recall, in Genesis chapter 12, God meets Abraham. He plucks him out of obscurity, and he says, listen, I'm going to bless you. Abraham did absolutely nothing, and God said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to provide for you in ways that you can't imagine, and I'm going to make your descendants greater than the stars in the sky. Abraham says, sounds like a great deal, right? He moves on with his life. He continues trying to follow God. But as time goes on, Abraham says, God, when are you going to give me this son? Because me and my wife, we're getting a little older, right? And God never provides that son when Abraham thinks he should. So Abraham takes matters into his own hands. And he has a son, Ishmael, with his servant, Hagar, and God, God tells him, no, this isn't the son that I promised to you, but I'm going to promise you a son, and he will be born to you. And when Abraham was 100 years old, his wife Sarah was 90 years old, they had their son Isaac. This is the son of promise, their only son through which all the nations of the world will be blessed, and he will make a great generation, a great people. Abraham is wealthy, happy, and now he has an heir. And God comes to him and he says, Take your son, your only son Isaac, and sacrifice him to me. You have to think what was going through Abraham's head in that moment. I don't know what would be going through my head. Absolutely not. No, this is my son who I love. Look at what Abraham says or does in verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place God told him. Now we read that and we think, man, Abraham is so holy. Abraham is so good. Abraham has a faith like I could never have. Because he rose early. And most of us have in our mind, Abraham, he set the alarm clock early. He said, God told me to do it. I'm going to set my alarm clock and I'm going to get up and I'm going to be ready to go and do that for him. But I heard one pastor say it this way. I think maybe he rose up early because he couldn't sleep at all that night. And he was tossing and turning in his bed. God, I'm wrestling with this. I don't know if I can do this. God, how could you ask me to do this thing? And I think he didn't get a wink of sleep that night. And as the sun came up, he said, I might as well just get up and get on with it. I think that the test of Abraham tested him to his very core. How could he give up this son? I think it was a big request from God. Look, Look at what he says, says in verse 4. On the, the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar. They went out. They had to travel three days to get to this place. Three days of torment for Abraham. Can you imagine with his son by his side, talking to him, shooting the breeze, talking about things, asking his dad questions. All the while, Abraham knew 
what what God had called him to do. And yet Abraham continued walking to that mountain. Then look at verse 5. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. And I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you again. We read that. I think it's interesting the word worship is included here. I'm sure Abraham said, you know, when we make a sacrifice, it's called worship. But I think if we go to the New Testament, actually, if you think of the Scriptures as a whole, to worship God is costly. It costs us something to worship Jesus. Jesus gives us some similar language in uh, Luke chapter 14. And in Luke chapter 14, Jesus says this in verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He continues, verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Look at verse 33. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. What goes through your mind when you hear those words of Jesus? I know at times in my life I've heard it, so that doesn't really apply to me. You know, that, 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 that's a little too much, and that's like serious, and Jesus was saying that, but that's not really what it means. And preachers are tempted to stand up here and say, you know what, here's what it really means in the original Greek and the original language and all this stuff. And I'm here to tell you that what Jesus means is what he says. If you want to follow him, it's going to cost you everything. That to follow Jesus and to be his disciple, you have to give up your life and your wants. You have to sacrifice those things and give them to God. Romans 12, 1 says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual what? Worship. The way you worship God is wake up every day and say, I'm a living sacrifice. I'm going to give up my desires. I'm going to give up my wants. I'm going to give up my resources. I'm going to give up my time for Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus, he asks that you would give up everything for him. Too often, other things are number one in our life. They take precedent. Jesus says, I'm the only Lord of your life. You must give it up and I must take Precedence. I want to ask, do you live each day as a living sacrifice? I want you to think about your day this past week. Has it been a living sacrifice to God? Or has it been, I'm going to live how I want, do what I want to do. And then I'll show up to church and say some good things and stuff like that and then continue on. Is every day a living sacrifice for you? Today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. There are brothers and sisters all around the world right now in 2024 who are being killed for their faith. They are being imprisoned for their faith. They are being banned from their families, disowned and kicked out of their homes because they believe in Jesus. One in seven Christians worldwide face persecution daily. There are so many people who sacrifice for Jesus, and I just have to think, myself included, if we were put in that same situation, would we endure? Would we be willing to sacrifice that for the kingdom? Church, what is God, is your response when God asks you to sacrifice for him? He wants your heart, all of it. Second question What idols are you unwilling to sacrifice? What idols in your life are you unwilling to sacrifice to God? Look at verse 6 in Genesis 22. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took his hand, the fire, and the knife. And they went, both of them, together. 
And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? I mean, can you imagine hearing that from your son as you're walking up that mountain? Can you imagine the pain in Abraham's heart? God, I can't go through with this. I can't do this, God. But yet Abraham took one more step because he had trust in God. He had faith in God. Look at verse 8. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Verse 9, and when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. He bound up his son, laid him on the wood. Can you imagine looking into your son's eyes in that moment? Can you imagine Isaac looking up in fear and terror, looking around, and Abraham knowing what he's about to do, and yet he still had faith in God. He still went forward. And then look at verse 10. When Abraham reached out his hand, took the knife to slaughter his son, as he took it and he had it held up, and he was ready to plunge it into the chest of his son, then we hear verse 11. But the angel called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Do you think Abraham's ever been more happy in his life to hear from an angel? That he could hear Abraham. He says, yes, here I am. I'll do whatever you want, right? He hears the angel. And what does he say? Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. told you earlier in verse 1, there was a test. Now we see what the test was all about. Abraham, what are you going to withhold from God? Abraham, what are you going to keep back from God? And I think for us, we have the same question. What are you going to withhold from God? What is God asking you to sacrifice or give up? Maybe it's some secret sin, some secret unconfessed sin. You say, God, I'm going to keep this sin. I'm going to hang on to it. Nobody knows about it, and it's going to be mine, and I'm going to have it. And you can have, you know, 95% of my life. You can have most of my heart, but you can't have that one little piece. Maybe it's this dream of the American life or this picture of your family or this way that you want to live, and you say, i got to have it just this way. God, you can have all this other stuff, and I'll do all these other things, but i got to have this one thing right here. And God asks us the same question What are you going to withhold from me? My son and daughter, Luke and Emily, they're eight and six now, and I've been trying to talk to them. They are kids, and so they talk about what they want to be when they grow up. And I've been trying to encourage them and kind of help them dream a little bit. And this is what I say, don't you want to be a doctor? Don't you want to be like a neurosurgeon, Luke and Emily? Don't you want to be like an engineer and work for NASA or something? They pay real good over there, right? A a surgeon, you could have a lot of money. You could have a lot of success. It would be really good. I'm trying to help them dream a little bit, right? I'm trying to put this in their mind because I want them to be successful. I want them to have all these things. So we've been doing this for a while. Don't you want to be a doctor? Don't you want to go into a profession where you can make lots of money? Two weeks ago, at their RAs and GAs on Wednesday night, we had an IMB missionary come and speak to them. And apparently, my kids were locked on every word she was saying. They were so excited to hear, and they were so intrigued and brokenhearted that there were lost people all over the world that didn't know about Jesus. And they rushed home, and they looked at me, and they said, Dad... We want to be missionaries. That's what we want to be when we grow up. And I have to confess here this morning that I was not joyful when I heard that. I have to confess with you to you this morning that it was through gritted teeth that I said, that's wonderful. Because here's what went in my head when we were missionaries. I remember saying goodbye to my parents and them crying at the airport. I remember being overseas and there was a time difference and we could have a spotty FaceTime reception and we couldn't really communicate all that well. 
I remember that my parents didn't really get to see the first year of Luke's life because we were halfway across the world. I remember that I didn't really make any money, didn't have any plan for retirement when I was overseas. And I thought, I don't want that for them. And I don't want that for me. I don't want God to take them away. I, I want them to be right close to me. I want them to make lots of money. I want them to take care of me when I get old. I want to see my grandkids. I don't want them to do that. And I thought, you know what, God? I'm going to withhold that from you. And I'm going to be honest, church, over the past couple of weeks, I've had to wrestle with that and I've had to repent. And I've had to give my children to the Lord. I've had to give their future to God. Say, God, I'm not going to withhold them from you. I'm not going to withhold their future. They are yours, and you can have them. Church, what are you hanging on to? What are you hanging on to that you won't give over to God? Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 8, he says this, a scribe came up to him and said to him, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. Verse 20, and Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Worshiping Jesus is costly. Following Jesus is costly. This scribe, he was likely a teacher of the law. He likely had a good reputation in the community. He had a comfortable life. He probably had a nice house, and he was uh, living a comfortable life. And so when he says, Jesus, I'll follow you, Jesus says, you're going to have to give up that comfortable life. You're not going to have your house. I don't have anywhere to lay my head, and neither will you. Will you give it up to follow me? The next person comes and asks him, first, let me go bury my father. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. What is Jesus saying here? Is he being insensitive? Well, likely this man's father hadn't just died and it was going to take one day to bury him and then go on and follow Jesus. Likely this man's father was alive and well. And what the man was really asking Jesus was saying, you know what? I got to stick around till he dies so I can get the inheritance. If I leave now, I won't get it. And so it might be five or 10 years, God, but, but then I'll follow you. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to give up that inheritance. These two things, comfort and money, I think speak to that culture and I think they speak to our culture today. They've become idols in our life. And we say, God, you can have all sorts of stuff as long as I can stay comfortable. Lord, you can have all kind of stuff as long as I keep my money Church, I want you to look in your heart and I want you to ask, what am I withholding from God? What am I keeping from Him? I want to tell you, if you exercise your faith, if you sacrifice your faith for God, it's worthwhile. You know what it does when you sacrifice? It increases your faith in God. Your relationship with Him grows stronger. It grows deeper. It grows more intimate. If you want to know how I know this, look at Abraham in this moment of trial and tribulation. How could he go through with this? How could he sacrifice this? In Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us exactly how. Hebrews 11 verse 17, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. All right, so in this exact moment, we're getting an insight into Abraham in this moment. And look at verse 19. Look at what it says. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. His faith grew in sacrifice. God, even if I take his life, I know you can bring him back. God, even if I don't understand it and don't want to do it, I know that you can make good out of it. I know your way is better than my way, so I'm going to give up, and I'm going to give up all of these things and these idols in my life because when I give it to you, you give me back so much more. And when I give it to you, it's so much better than going after myself. I want to ask Abraham, sacrifice because he had faith in God. And if you're unwilling to sacrifice for God, I have to ask, where is your faith? If you're unwilling to make a sacrifice for God, 
You have to ask, where is your faith rest? In yourself and in those things? Or does it rest in Almighty God? True faith is always tested. God didn't want Isaac's life, but he wanted Abraham's heart. And God wants your heart, but you have to sacrifice those idols. You have to remove them, take them out so that you can know Jesus. Third question. What has God sacrificed for you? What has God sacrificed for you? Isaac is spared, but guess what? They didn't go right back down the mountain. They still had to worship. They still had to worship. And Abraham had said in verse 8, God's going to provide the lamb for the sacrifice. And look at verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. God provided on that mountain. That mountain is Mount Moriah. It was a general location. It doesn't give us the exact mountain, but it was a general location. And 2,000 years later, after Abraham, it would be known as Jerusalem. And it's in that same place on a mountain that God would send his only son for us. Isaac had wood and he put it on his back as he carried it up that mountain. And 2,000 years later in that same place, God's only son would carry wood on his back for you and me. And the only difference between these two accounts is that 2,000 years later when Jesus hung on the cross, nobody said, stop. God wasn't willing, wasn't asking Abraham to do something that he wasn't willing to do himself. And instead of Isaac being sacrificed or a ram that could never take away our sins, God sacrificed his only perfect son on the cross for you and for me. And now he offers salvation to us freely. Church, what is your response to that? Is your response, that's pretty good, I'll take it, but I want to keep living how I want to live? Or is it, Lord, that's so good, I'll give up anything to know Jesus. I'll give up anything and sacrifice anything to have that relationship with you. Think about it in this way, when we become a Christian, it's almost like uh, two people joining together at a wedding. In a wedding or in a uh, family, when these two people come together, there's three things that happen. There's the emotion, there's the intellect, and there's the will. It starts like this. If a man sees a woman and his emotion says, I like her. I like the way she looks. I like the way she talks. And my emotions, I want to marry that girl. But then his intellect will come in and it'll say, hey, are we really compatible? Is this really going to work? I I might need to take a little time. And so the intellect says, let's take a little time. And they date one another and they get to know one another. And the intellect and the emotions come together and they say, you know what? This is going to be a good fit. Let's get married. And they go and they march down the aisle and they stand before one another in front of all the other people. But then here comes the will. And I believe this is the most important part because the will must decide, am I willing to give up my lifestyle for this other person? Am I willing to give up my freedoms for this person? Am I willing to sacrifice these other relationships so I can be in a relationship with that person? And I think for you and for me, we must ask the same question. Coming to Christ What am I willing to sacrifice to know Jesus, to experience him? I want to tell you, church, the sacrifice has already been made for you. Salvation is a free gift. Would you take it? Would you say, Jesus, I don't want you to be second or third in my life. I want you to be number one. I want to close with this story. As I told you, it was the day of international prayer for the persecuted church. There is a man who lives in Ethiopia. He was a Muslim, and his name was Kofi. 
Kofi lived in Ethiopia, went to the mosque every day, but then he heard from an evangelist about Jesus and God got a hold of his heart and he believed and trusted in Christ as Lord. And as he began to grow in his faith, he began to go out and to preach and tell other people about Jesus. And just like in the book of Acts, now it's happening in our modern day, the mosque leaders... The imams from the mosque came and said, you can't do that. And they pulled him in and they had a trial and they said, we're going to harm you. We're going to hurt you if you continue preaching. And he said, I can't stop. Jesus has changed my life. I can't stop. I'll give anything for Jesus. They set up a, a plan. The Muslims did. The Islam leaders did. And they jumped Kofi one day and they beat him mercilessly in a mob. So much so that Kofi was taken to the hospital and they had to amputate his left hand because he was beaten so badly. And when he was in the hospital, some Christians visited him and he said these words, I'm happy not only to give my hand for Jesus, but I'm ready to give my life for faith in Jesus. Church, I want to tell you Jesus is worth the sacrifice. He's worth your whole heart, not just part of it. Would you give your life to him in sacrifice today? Let's pray. I do want to take this time with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you are here today and you are not a Christian and you say, you know what? I've never surrendered my life to Jesus. I've never followed him. I want to tell you, Jesus gave up his life for you. God did not spare his own son so that you might have life. And if you're here today and you say, you know what, I wanna believe in Jesus. I wanna give my life for Jesus. Let today be the day. Walk down this aisle, please come and find me. I wanna tell you what it means to follow Jesus and to know him and to have a relationship with him. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what? I've been withholding something from God. I'm a Christian, I've given my life to Jesus, but there's this one part that I'm still hanging on to. I want you to give it to him today. Don't hold it back from him, but give him your whole heart today. Father, I pray that you would help us. Father, I pray that you would remove any idols that are in our life. And Lord, I pray that we would surrender them to you totally and completely. We ask this.